George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. We're continuing our coverage of Dell Storage Forum 2012 in Boston, Massachusetts. Joining me today is Tom Habing, uh, manager of library software development. Tom, what uh, university are you from? I'm with the uh, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I think you guys have a really interesting project. I know that you're one of the largest uh, libraries in the university system worldwide. Yes, we uh, claim to have one of the largest public university libraries in the world. Wow, and then and and I know that we were talking. You have some issues. With, you were having some issues with all the digital content. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, we have a lot of kind of what we call digital silos, digital ghettos of data that have accumulated over many years within the library. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples okay. of the kind of material that we deal with in the library. Uh, one example would be our university archives, which is charged with uh, preserving uh, the uh, intellectual output of faculty members over long periods of time, for example. So uh, typically a faculty member retires, and, and this may be a famous person who mm -hmm. has had a big uh, impact on his field. A box of his papers are delivered to the university archives when he retires. Now it's more likely to be a box of floppy disks, and you can imagine that over, I mean, a faculty member who's been with the university for 20, 25, 30 years, he's got five and a quarter floppies, yeah. three, uh, four and a half inch floppies, oh, <laughs> uh, zip disks. Oh, wow. uh, he, we might literally have the disk removed from his workstation, maybe two or three workstations. They're all delivered to the university archives, and the university archives has to sort of make sense of this, of this digital uh, mess, uh, so to speak, that, put that it documents the, this faculty member's work over his career. Wow. Geez. Any, any other examples? Uh, other examples, uh, we actually have an ongoing uh, digital content and cre a, a group called Digital Content and Creation, and they're charged with uh, digitizing various materials for special projects within the library. It could be a whole corpus of, of rare books, for example. It could be a faculty member needs a digitized map for some publication that he's working on. Wow. And so those would go to this, uh, this digital content creation group. They have a suite of various uh, cameras, scanning equipment, and so forth, and, and they will digitize this material. And, and we want to get to, and, and right now this material is just uh, stored on our typical SAN uh, uh, storage. Uh, maybe with a very minimal amount of metadata. And what we want to do is sort of get, get our arms around all of this uh, data and management, manage it in a more sort of coherent and, uh, and sort of a, a, a forward-thinking uh, manner. Okay. Well. Uh, well, I know you were talking earlier that some of that um, more historical uh, information, mm -hmm. you've only got one shot to get it in, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, some of these rare books uh, are very fragile. They may be one of a kind. And so you don't want to handle them too much uh, during a scanning process, and so we might get one chance to scan one of these rare books, and we want to make sure we get it right the first time. And after we do get it digitized, we want to make sure that we can manage that for uh, for posterity. I mean, these paper books have existed for 500 right, or sure. more years, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, the digital facsimiles of those books uh, can potentially survive for an equal uh, period of time. Right. Well, no pressure in that job, huh? No. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so you you had mentioned earlier that you were kind of using a, a standard SAN, at, uh, I guess, at first, and then now uh, we, we know, obviously, that you're using the DX4000. How did that transition work? Well, we're engaged in a project we call our Medusa Digital Preservation Archive. It's, uh, it's in the early stages right now. Uh, the name Medusa, uh, we are using some other uh, software frameworks like Hydra, for example, and so mm -hmm. we wanted to stick with a mythological theme. Okay. Our, our analogy is we turn data to stone, although I don't really like that analogy yeah. because... One of, one of the tenets of our, of our process is that uh, you're not really just sort of creating a static copy of this data and shoving it into an archive. What you want to do is have active management of that data. Okay. And so the idea is that you have metadata uh, that's associated with this that you, can, that you can use to make preservation decisions and perform preservation actions on, over the lifetime of these objects. And like okay. I said, that li we're envisioning that that's a very long lifetime. Right. And so we want technical detail about this is a JP2000 file format that maybe uses a particular color encoding scheme. 
and so on and so forth, so that at some point in the future, maybe 10 years from now, we can do an assessment of the JP2000 format, mm -hmm. and we maybe des decide that uh, that format is becoming obsolete. And so right. based on our metadata, we can identify all those objects and perform preservation actions. In this so case, it could, do be a a, conversion. could be a migration to whatever the latest wow. digital format is. Huh. And in some cases, it might be subtle. It may not be the JP2000 format that's becoming obsolete, but it may be sort of one of the little subcomponents of that, like the color coding scheme or okay. maybe a uh, compression uh, algorithm that's used, and so the software is sort of disappearing that supports that particular So is format. object count a big issue for you guys then, too? Is it, I mean, you're dealing, I would assume, with millions of, or billions of objects. Yes, a lot of objects. And so to give you another example of, of that, uh, like uh, digitizing a book, especially like a rare book that we want to have quality images. Uh, we have what, what we consider our archival master and our production master. Mm -hmm. These can be very high resolution TIFF or JP2000 images. The right. archival master, and I, I'm not an expert on digitiza digitization by any means, but I know that they have like the little color strips that they use so that they can get color correction applied sure. to these uh, uh, things. And so that's the archival master. Production master, uh, maybe we de-skew the image, it got a little off-center when they digitized it. They will crop it so that it actually looks like a page image and oh, things okay. like that. Still very high resolution, but it's maybe uh, more suited to access purposes. And so those are two very high quality uh, archival images that would get preserved in this uh, archive. We also would do OCR in some cases, and so we would have the textual versions of that if, oh, okay. if that's possible. Book several hundred pages, and so multiply that by three or four for these various derivative images, and so you've got uh, uh, six, eight hundred uh, digital objects for one book, for example, right. and then multiply that by lots of books that we're right. digitizing in the library. So how does the, the DX4000 kind of fit into that infrastructure? What are you using it for, things like that? Well, when we started uh, looking at storage for our particular project, I mean, we knew that we wanted, uh, we wanted geographically dispersed uh, replication uh, happening. We also wanted continuous checksum validation. I think in the DX, this is uh, uh, what they call their health processor, for right. example. So it's continually making sure that these files aren't suffering from bit rot. If it discovers a discrepancy, it will automatically sort of kick in and create extra copies of something. So I mean, if you, if you suffer a disaster, for example, and we lose a storage node or lose an individual disk on that storage node, we can be relatively assured that, that we're going to maintain the, at least right. a, a minimum number of copies. Or, or if there's just a stray gamma ray that right. tweak, tweaks a bit, uh, uh, the system will detect that as well and, right. and sort of uh, create additional copies of that file to ensure it's a long-term uh, uh, preservation of that, of that object. What, um, so what does the environment look like uh, now from a just you know, number of nodes and capacity, and what do you expect it to kind of grow to going forward? Well, we have, we have uh, two subclusters on our campus right now of the, of the DX mm -hmm. in different buildings on campus. That gives us a little bit of geographic uh, dispersal of the data. So if there's a, like a tornado, for example, it wipes out one building, we've still right. got the other building. What we're shooting for is to actually have a wider area uh, replication. And so we are looking at deploying potentially another DX at our Chicago campus, which is about 100 miles away from, uh, from Urbana-Champaign. Okay. And, and we're also looking at cloud storage uh, options a, as well for sort of that third copy. So right now, we're, we're, our, our policy is at least three copies, one copy in our engineering library, one copy in our main library. There's a third copy that just kind of floats around, but we want to get that third copy off of our campus for, for preservation purposes. That makes sense. And with this kind of architecture, I mean, that we're not we're not doing sort of traditional backups at all. I mean, we're relying on lots of copies to, to keep right. this uh, digital material uh, safe. Yeah, well, with the capacities you're talking about, backups are almost going to be an impossibility anyways, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at maybe 100 terabytes uh, within the next several years, I think. And like I said, we're kind of at a pilot stage uh, for this. I mean, we're developing some software. Uh, our, our repository is based on some open source software called the Fedora Commons, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, you can think of as sort of the, the repository plumbing, if you okay. will. It has a fairly rudimentary uh, administrative interface. Uh, it's all, I mean, and, and this is another reason that we kind of gravitated toward the DX system is that a lot of these open source repository systems are all have the HTTP, HTTP REST based right. interfaces, which is one of the features of, of the DX system. Okay. Another feature of the Fedora Commons software is that it has a pluggable storage architecture. 
And so, and, and that storage architecture they call a Kubra. And so the default for that is just to use the, uh, uh, I mean, a traditional file system that, that is on the, on the server. It could be a SAN or, or, or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, you sort of point it to the root directory and it starts creating subdirectories for storing these digital objects. What we've done is to pull out that sort of default storage layer, storage plugin, if you will, and we've rewritten our own plugin, which communicates with the DX system using the SC, SP, HTTP sort of Git RESTful interface for right. that. So, so really, uh, it, you know, it's kind of wrap up here. Almost any uh, environment, be it you know an educational mm -hmm. university or uh, certainly organizations that produce a lot of content like this, as they mm -hmm. go to digitize, these sort of solutions are really going to become the the next wave because you've got this sort of a uh, very long retention that we really haven't thought about in the past and incredibly high object count, right? Yes, exa exactly. I mean, that's another nice feature of the DX is sort of the, the, the plug and play uh, aspects of it. So as your, as your storage needs grow, you add a storage node and boot it and it instantly becomes part of your storage cluster, if right. you will. Likewise, as you retire old nodes uh, out of the cluster, I mean, they, they pass their useful lifetime uh, you just, you just pull them out, and the system will automatically sort of see that right. uh, that node as missing, and start creating uh, extra copies right. of the files. Well, with, with 100 terabytes, you can't do a copy start out star and uh, move it, over to it, a new it, system. It, yes, it's exactly. got to grow with you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate that. My pleasure. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Uh, we'll continue our coverage of Dell Storage Forum 2012 in Boston, Massachusetts.